Rush. So welcome back to our series on cutters. Uh, as you know, we've already finished the pinna cutters and today we're starting to do with the uh, Kishanku. So uh, it's a long cutter, so it might be three or four uh, dips into it. Uh, so please bear with us. As always, taking the hits. I mean, partnering me is <laughs> Sensi Kerrymore. So thank you, Sensi, for uh, joining us. Okay, Aish. Shanku. Okay, um, when you first start uh, Kushanku, your stance is wider than your Shizentai stance. Uh, not sure why. This one's a lot more stable, but uh, I'm sure somebody out there will tell me exactly why Kushanku is slightly wider than, uh, than the norm. Uh, hand positions, left hand on the outside. When you come up and go around, you have the right hand inside for no specific reason other than if you went to do Nihanch, you would end up at the start of Kushanku. If you went on the other side, you wouldn't have that. So it's not faster, it's not, you know, it's not anything practical, it's just the fact that when you come to do Nihanch, your hands are back into the same place. Okay, uh, when you're actually doing this move, there's lots of uh, explanations for it. I'm sure, uh, I'm sure your uh, instructors will have their own reason for doing it, but for me, a practical reason is A for breathing. You're breathing in. Breathing out. Ready for the attack. So once you've breathed out, you can't get winded. The other thing, to think about is to try and realize your, your cone of vision. So from looking straight ahead, you should realize where your eyesight actually reaches. And the same here. So don't get doing this, <laughs> else you'll never realise your, uh, your cone of vision. So if you can keep to the periphery of this cone, A, you'll get a perfect circle and B, you'll realise where your cone vanishes. Uh, my instructor, Takamizo Sensei, many years ago, he put a time into it, so it was, uh, I believe it was about seven, eight, nine, ten. So it was basically to try and get everybody within the institute to do Kashanku the same speed. Else you get people going, oh, or you get people going, and then you lose the like, will to live with people doing it really, really, really slow. So it was just to give it some sort of uniformity. When you're actually doing this move as well, since you couldn't borrow you, it's a good time to practice with your partner, your internal. So here, try and use, try and use your 
your back, your behind you, your here, down by your lats, down, up, then to the top to come, down. So try and use your, your lats and then move to the top to come down. So it's quite good to have a partner trying that. Yep. So that's the first few moves. Thank you. If I'm going to the stance now, you have a lot of people that just take the foot to the side. And what happens is the knee drops in. So really, you need to go to the side and backwards. So that when you bring this foot back, somehow it prevents the, the knee from dropping in. So take time to go backwards and into it. Then it comes up and backwards and sideways again. And this actually has quite a dramatic effect on, uh, on the attack. So we'll, we'll use it stationary at the moment. Well, either hand, it doesn't matter which. Yeah, if I just go to the side, if I go back and to the side, and all I've done is I've kept the stance. So again, if I just go to the side, If I go to the side and back, definitely has a, a different feeling to it. So take time to go to the side and back. To the side and back. Oish. So the next, next portion is uh, one, two, three, four, five. So, use suri to take them off balance, then punch, then the gaku comes, move to the side. Don't drop this hand, keep the hand up, then your hikitai. So, not too much hip, if I do too much hip, I'll leave this open. So if I try it again, if I turn too much, it goes through. By keeping square and doing suri, not a problem. Here, slowly. Okay, I want to be moving to off center. So I've moved. Now I turn the hip and the head. Try not to turn straight away, because then all you have is your arm to uki. You want to put your body with your hip twist behind it. Next thing is, don't drop this hand straight away. Use it. For your punch. So here, Move, move. Try not to keep Gakazuki Natsukami stance. Junzuki stance is fine. Facing this way. And then punch. When you do Nagash, Nagashizuki, you don't drop the arm straight away. You keep it up. Zanshin awareness. So, one, two, three. You leave your arm up to the last portion of the move. So the same here. One, keep it up. And punch. So our next portion is the same. We move, we move again. We come up. And into shooter. Stoke. 
Stouch, Stouk. So, uh, from here, you just ook it, but there doesn't seem to be an attack. So, whoever you've done the ookie to here, is waiting while you do the uki and the kete, then you come in for the shuto. So, something doesn't ring true. Could have done a yurakan. Uh, but the only thing that's moving is your leg. So, I'm not saying this is correct or not, but to me, it put a meaning behind the movement of the foot as, uh, as well as moving your body. So, here, we move to the side, take. We're going to come up, kete, and into the shuto. Yep. So, I'm not adding anything into the kata, it's just giving a purpose, a meaning. Instead of just leaving this here, we're doing the yurakan. Coming up. So, keep low, hook. And stow. Okay, so next is uh, guy one, my get eight to attack here. Yeah, and then the one, two, three shootouts and the nukate. So when you're practicing this, try and use uke and uchi. So use your uki and a, a strike as well. Your stance should be the same. If it's here, you lean your back too much. Here, you have a totally different feeling. So if Sensi Keri, here, if I'm, if I'm here, this feels definitely like just an uki trying to uki. But as soon as I hook or pull this one in, then it puts a different feeling. And I feel different as well, rather than just going block, uki, uki. So try and mix them up, keep the same stance, but try and use shto, not just as a nuki, but as a strike. So, okay, so, dun and shto, 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 and nuktai. Okay, so after the nukatai, yeah, cover, kick, down, through, and up. Um, I think we've done enough in Pinan Yondan to show the, this sort of uh, uke and strike. So, yeah, one, two, Three. Yeah, so make sure you use one and two. Yeah? Make sure you're covering as you come round. Or even if there's just a gakazuki. But make sure this one's coming through to cover. Next portion is this. And again, there's lots of interpretations of what you're doing, how you're doing it. Again, so if your instructor doesn't particularly like this one, then do, obviously go away and practice the bunko corsets that, uh, that he or she tells you to do, okay? Um, forgive me, really I need to go lower, but I've still not quite got enough confidence in my hip yet. It's getting there, but it's not 100%. So I won't go down as low as I should do. So, after here, I'm open for this Gakuzuki. Thank you, Kerry. So, I sh here. So, after I've, after I've kicked, yeah, after I've kicked, then move out the way, and then cover. Next one, hit the thigh. Punch the thigh, and then strike. So, once more, 
after I've kicked, move out the way. Turn, punch, and strike. You can take the heel and take the knee and throw it to the floor and strike as they're going down. But uh, when you're practicing, forward, then turn and look through. Go down as much as you can, underneath, and then show, show that you've got the muscles to do a good my getty, good marshy getty. Try not to go over here, because when you go down, you will lose your balance. You want to be in the center. Drop down, underneath, and up. So I want to show this power that you've got in your leg from your kicks. Oi. So you do start to see glimpses of uh, your pinhead cutters. So here, this one when you went down and up, it doesn't take too much of imagination to think of your, your pinhead shoulder move. So just do this move again. So. Pinhead show done yeah and then the same again the other side yeah pin and show done for the arm movements and um, also when you come to do the next moves which is uh, yeah my getting MP then that's uh, obviously your pin and yon done so again you uh, you just use to uki and then use it as a target. Or you can use it to pull them on. And come up and the same the other way. So the next part is uh, obviously from uh, Pinan Yonda. So make sure you do the Uki. Same as time as you do that. There should be the Maigeri going in. Then this one is a target, or you can use it for pulling in. So one, two. Repeat it on the other side. It's always better if you do the uki, the suri, on the outer portion of the arm. Because you've got the arm working against the body. If it's on the inside, there's obviously a natural joint here that wants to open up before the, the body. But if you can, use the outside. Can you see the difference in the effect? The suri. Hmm. So from here, sto, 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 sto. Then, then you go forward for your uh, pinanyon then. So, we'll try and put some moves to that. The attack isn't from here. We're going to go through the racing line and go past the racing line. So, here. Then, we can go for the shito. So, here you're using shitouki and shitouchi. Strike. So, defend and strike. And then the same will happen on the other side. So make sure that they're coming in at an angle, yeah? You're going through, and then strike. So next. Sto. Cover, cover, strike. And drop. This is a typical of covering from head right the way down past the groin. So you need to drop and make sure it covers all the way through. And as you drop in, this will benefit from the drop from your body weight. And so will the attack. So make sure you soft and you drop. Drop your weight. 
Push back. Nihon Zuki. So we'll go through that. Okay. So I've done the Shuto. We cover. Cover. Kick going forward. Drop. 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 Then punch. Back in one, two. So it's once this uh, back and drop into it. Reusable. Yes, flow. Yeah, flow back into it. So you've done. Yeah, cover, cover, in, drop, push. One, two. So it's one, two. Oi. Okay, so this next move is about body movement. The punch will be coming from the back or the side, maybe the side here, so as you could, you could actually catch a glimpse of it, rather than uh, doing an exorcist move where your head turns round. So instead of doing this, and your body will still be on the center and you'll still get hit, we want to move the center from here to here for the technique to come through. And also we want to start using parts from station. Here. So let me try and demonstrate. Okay. So the punch would be coming here. So I need to turn. And cover. And come up. And hit. And knee and down again so turn up up knee through Sto. so one one two one two one Ready? One, two, three, four, eight! So, when you're doing this single moves, then back leg, drop, then carry on through. When you're doing a, a combination, blend these together and then if you want a more practical for your uh, sparring then if I can use sensor carry here Okay, so we're going to uh, look at that section. So um, the way to practice it is to have um, two people attacking from both sides. Therefore, your, your technique will be swift. You have to move quickly 
to get out of the way of two caddies, but in reality, you're only using one caddy. So if, uh, if I can use two gentlemen here. So slowly, uh, to, you know, to my geddes. Okay, so you need to start off with three people and make sure that you are... Oish. You're moving away from this kitty and I'm moving quickly around the other one. So, oish. And then up. I'm not going to do it today. So I'll let Kerry not do his Kerry. Here. And up. You have to use your legs and your arms. And then right leg in. Left leg, right leg. Right. Um By now you'll have seen the... Uh, video demonstrations with Sensei showing you the kata, running through the kata, bunkai. Uh, but there's more to Kushanku than the bunkai. Uh, a lot of the bunkai in Kushanku you may have already covered in the Pinans. Uh, so you should be sort of fairly familiar. So there should be more to Kushanku than just repeating what you've already done. Uh, as we touched on with Pinan Godan, you have the jump. And we mentioned that a lot of um, isometric training involves static leaping onto boxes to develop huge power in the legs and the midsection. So hopefully by now, you've developed enough physical strength through practicing the five pinan cutters to get to Kushanku. Uh, I watched a video the other day, it wasn't about uh, karate fitness training, it was general fitness training. And the first thing they suggested people did was stand in Kibadachi for as long as possible because it develops huge leg strength. So your five pin and kata should have got you to this stage, the jumping go down should have developed more strength. So with Kushenku, the additional purpose, as far as I can see, is fitness and endurance. To do the whole kata with full intensity and full kimai is tiring, exhausting, and if you do it several times, it's very tiring, very exhausting. So hopefully now your five pin hands are giving you the strength, now Kashanku is going to give you the endurance. And that's the physical aspect, is, is developing endurance through practicing the kata. But the other uh, is the mental aspect, is if you do it with full kamei, full focus, full intent, to maintain that for the entire length of the kata is quite a challenge. You can do it in a pinan because they're not so long. You can really perform at the full mental output, full kimai. But to do it in Kushanku is a whole other matter. So you should or may be useful if you can look for little mushin sections, no mind. So points where you can take a breather and just sort of let it go a little bit before you go back to the full intent, full kimai. If you're doing big long catters, it's a very useful little trick to put in your arsenal. It's to find these little pauses where you can mentally and physically take a, take a break. So you're not trying to blast through the catter like a metronome. So that's a, another way of thinking of Kashanku, beyond the physical, getting into the mental aspects. Uh, the other is interpretation. There are some odd looking movements in uh, Kashanku. And this is where you can look at them and you can take them as a literal interpretation or try and be a little bit more imaginative. Um, and as I've said with uh, the, the pinans, is I've been trying to look at them in a more throwing and grappling and takedown frame of mind rather than just a, a pure block punch. I set myself a little project for each year in, in January. And the project for this year is takedowns and throws. It's something that's got lost in karate, I feel, over the years. And to complete the system, you need to have them. You don't have to be an expert at judo or jiu-jitsu, but if you've got them in your arsenal, it's very useful. 
So we'll have a little look at some of these interpretations that may be more throw in joint locking um, rather than just pure karate. Uh, and then there's the history of the kata. Uh, people seem to agree that Kushanku was a real person. Um, some say he was a Chinese military official, some say a Chinese diplomat, some say he was a Chinese sailor. But sometime in the 1700s, he arrived in Okinawa and brought this kata with him. Uh, and Kushanku is apparently the Okinawan pronunciation of his Chinese name. So it seems fairly certain there was an actual person and Kushanku is the Okinawan version of his name. So this sort of kata is at least 300 years old if Kushanku himself invented it. But it may have been already 300 years old by the time Kushanku brought it to China, uh, to Okinawa. So the history gets a little bit vague and that can be one of those glass half empty, glass half full. The glass half empty would be, well, we've lost all this fantastic knowledge over the 300 years. The glass half full would be, okay, we don't know what Mr. Kushanku was thinking with his kata. So this gives us the opportunity to create our own interpretations. Maybe they're nowhere near as good, but maybe they're better. So as we can't know what was the original intentions, we've got to try and come up with our, our best ideas of what we can do with them. And uh, the final uh, point is we've mentioned in the uh, Pinan series about the three phase fighting system. So you've got your stand up, your block punches, your grappling, which we've covered in the Pinans. The third phase is the floor work. So I had a little look at one of the techniques in Kushanku and it can be adapted quite easily to floor work. So we'll finally get around to the third phase, which is going to the floor. Uh, looking at an interpretation of the section in the kata where we have this type of technique. Um, yes, you can sort of, it's, it's a block, uh, another block for a lower level attack, but you can also use it as a springboard to an attack and into an arm lock and get rid of your opponent. So for example, if we're both in this fighting position, I can use this to push in. I've taken control of him, pushed in, strike, wrap underneath, arm lock him, come up, send him on his way. So we now have a strike, an arm lock, controlling your opponent. So that's back to this idea of Tagumi. So rather than it being a strike and a block, it's now an arm lock. So that's the second of the, the three phases we, we're going to speak about. So a further section of the kata involves dropping to the floor. Um, looking at that as a practical technique uh, in Sensei's demonstration, doing leg grabs. So this is a potential counter for a leg grab. So if we imagine I've done a Mayagari, he's caught it. A simple way to get out of this catch is to take control and push down. If we apply the principles in the kata, we've got the leg grab, compression strike, boom. Push down to release, drop to take his leg, take him to the floor. So that now becomes a practical, useful technique. If your legs got caught, you can get out, compression strike, very powerful. If I hit him normally, his head can rock. Compression strike, he's got nowhere to go. You get hit with them and it feels like a bolt's gone straight through your head. Horrible. Kick out, grab, take him to the floor. So a nice, useful, practical technique. We have the, the luxury of uh, video these days. So you can rewind these videos, watch them multiple times, put them on slow-mo, really get the most out of them. But years gone by, you only had books. 
and I've got sort of several books at home from various karate masters from years gone by. Uh, and it's frustrating because you can see the pictures, but you have to try and mentally fill in the bits in between. So I've had to sort of think about this. And if, if you imagine we were going to make a book, you would have to take photographs of the key points of a technique and then put that in the book and then hopefully people can fill in the gaps. So for example, if I was going to, uh, in a book, show an Agoshi judo throw, I would have to set up various key points within the throw. So if I can borrow Simon, we would potentially be starting here. The next photograph would be here, what we've seen in the cutter. And then the final would be here, ready to do the throw. So you have to look at some of these techniques when they hit a point and think to yourself, well, if I was taking photographs of that for a book, what is that telling me? Uh, and it may be unrelated to the thing that actually comes after it. They're just hitting a point to say, you are potentially doing a throw here. But if the throw is not available, then we'll go and do something else. But if you sort of think of it in that, in that mindset rather than video, um, you know, th this made absolutely no sense to me at all until I thought about it in freeze frame. My leg's caught, I'll hit him, get out, grab his ankles, throw him. All of a sudden it makes a lot of sense. So that could be a useful way if you see things in catas and you go, well, I can't understand that. Imagine you're taking photographs that you need to put in a book and you can only photograph the key points of the technique. And then hopefully everybody else can fill in the blanks between. So we mentioned uh, in the key points about literal and more imaginative interpretations of techniques. Um, so we're going to demonstrate the end section of the kata and do it as a literal interpretation. Uh, we mentioned in the Pinan series uh, that the whole point of kata is you can pick and mix the techniques as you need them. They don't have to be done in sequence and they don't have to be related to each other. So we're going to use a section of the kata and then go into the end section. So this is from earlier section in the kata. This is going to be the literal translation underneath. Lift him up. From here, I would throw him and let concrete and gravity do the work. Uh, powerful. I mean, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't drop him on these mats and not nowhere near thick enough. But that's a literal uh, interpretation of that technique. You know, we're hoisting somebody up, throw them on the floor. So this is another interpretation of the end section of the kata. As we mentioned, um, you can pick and mix. So in the previous one, we used block and punch from the middle section of the kata. This time we're going to the beginning of the kata and then doing a slightly different interpretation of the takedown at the end. So, the attack comes in, we're going to use Miyota Day. Since I discussed this in uh, earlier, where we use husband and wife hands. Strike. The kata tells me to go round behind him. So I'm going to go round behind him, hands on the shoulders. Take him down. So we covered this in the, the Pinan, uh, Pinan Shodan, uh, where if your spider sense tells you somebody behind you, that might work. But more realistically, what it's telling you is you need to be behind your opponent. So we're using that same principle again. The hands up, takes your shoulders, Use his foot coming round as an ashy barai and pull him down. 
And one final interpretation uh, of the is um, I've seen this on an old World War II military commando training video. Uh, so certainly in World War II, the Royal Marine Commandos were, were using this. So if it's good enough for them, I think it's good enough for me. So again, same principle, attack comes in, Miyoto day. So we're back to the beginning of the kata. Kata tells us to go behind him. We go behind him, take his legs, take him to the floor. For safety's sake, went to the knees. As we mentioned with one of the earlier takedowns, if you can go right down to the ankles, hoist the ankles up face first into the ground. And you're letting gravity and concrete do the work. So just slightly different ways of looking at you know, potential techniques in the cutter. Hopefully you might find some use with it. And the final of the key points, and we've mentioned it all through the, the Pinan series, is this idea of three phase. We've done block punch, we've done grapple, we've now gone to the floor. And again, it's another interpretation of this final section of the kata. A lot of stuff that you do standing up, you can apply to the floor. Um, and especially, we're going to be looking at these juji arm positions. So, we've taken him to the floor. Uh, as, as Fantastic videos out there about how to pass the guard. We won't get into that. But what we'll do is imagine we've taken him to the floor and we've gone into full mount. Now the kata shows us kibadachi. So kibadachi can be putting the hooks in into his feet. If you do shikadachi and turn your feet out, he can escape. If you do kibadachi, turn your toes in, you've hooked him. That makes it much more difficult for him to try and get me off, off from full mount. Not impossible, but more difficult. So now, if we look at these potential uh, jujuki positions, if we take his arm, yep, there's the one part of the juju. Swipe round to isolate the shoulder, come through for the juji. Here we go. Americana, quite a common uh, jiu-jitsu move you see in MMA fights. So that's just a reinterpretation of the jiu position with the hooks in, in Kibadachi. That's a little bit technical. If you want to really quick and dirty, we've got our hooks in, we come underneath, hand across, it's called an Ezekiel choke. It takes nothing, grip your own forearms, compress. So now we're into floor fighting techniques, but we're using the techniques that we were learning standing up. Choked him out. The final position. Rake the eyes. So the entire last section of the kata, we've managed to do that on the floor. So just because you're standing up doesn't mean you can't do it on the deck. So thank you for uh, watching our version of uh, Kushanku. Um, I'll say it again, I'll always say it, uh, if your instructor does not want to do any of this, then please respect them. Uh, this is again, this is just us um, looking at the catcher in different ways. Um, Kushanku, what does it mean to me? Uh, I can remember, and I'm sure you can when you first I started to learn Kishanku, uh, you thought I'm never go ever going to uh, remember 70 odd moves. Okay, so my advice if you're starting to learn um, Kishanku, then it's, it's basically, uh, you can split it up into four sections. Uh, from the start up till the three shootos, and then from the three shoot shootos to the two shootos, two shootos to the one shooto, and from the one shoot out to the end. So if you break it down into four portions, don't try and learn it all in one. Just go up to the four shoot outs. Three, two, one, to the end. So that's a good way of breaking the cutter down and portioning it out. Um, 
Since you mentioned about uh, the mental aspect of Kishanka as well, uh, and I'm sure you've uh, all done it, you start off with all good intentions, great stances, good mental attitude, then you get faster and faster and faster and faster, and your stances get shorter and shorter and shorter, till at the end, you've got no catcher at all. So, first of all, once you've learned all the moves, then try and do it so as it's just flowing. So there's no one, two, three, stop. One, two, three, yeah. Just make sure it flows all the way through. Real sweet, all the way through. And then start to do it slowly. So you have time to finish off your stances, finish off your technique. And then what you need to do then is amalgamate all that Ryusui, all that flowing technique and break it down into sections and have the physical and mental aspect that goes with it. It is demanding, so but it's there. And it's a fundamental part of most karate styles. So um, yeah, hope you've enjoyed it. Um, if you have, please like, if you haven't, so, uh, yeah, and keep the communication up as well. As I said before, we enjoy it. So, thank you very much. Ish.